You are listening to Gangland Wire, hosted by former Kansas City Police Intelligence Unit Detective Gary Jenkins. Welcome, all you wiretappers out there. Once again, I'm in the studio, Gangland Wire. You know, I am on the phone now with a pretty well-known guy, especially back in the day, Michael DeLeonardo. I hope I didn't butcher that up too bad. Mike, I've got this Northwest Missouri nasal twang, and and, and sometimes I get too many vowels in the name, I, I butcher the heck out of them. I need to get my butcher's apron on. I, I was 11 years old before I could articulate the name properly. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, and uh, so you uh, you were a, uh, a capo in the in the Gotti family, actually the Gambino family, which is kind of interesting. It, it stayed, it it kept the Gambino family name all the way to present time in in the news. I've noticed, and Gotti's name didn't ever get attached to that. I've never understood how they attach a name to a, a crime family, but but you were you know you were born into this thing almost. It, it looks to me like so. Uh, could you uh, start out a little bit about uh, your family history? And, and how you were, uh, what, what we call a legacy into uh, the La Cosa Nostra? Yeah, sure. Um, my family goes back, uh, I'm Sicilian, and my family goes back uh, a couple hundred years being involved in the mafia or Cosa Nostra or, or another term called Fratnazella. They had different terms for what they called each other years ago and then how it migrated to the States. So my great-grandfather, my grandfather, which got here in uh, 1895 with his family, when he got to the country, he was already set up. The, the people he went to see from people that was from Sicily, that where he was sent over to the people he had to go see in, in the States. And he was only 15 when he got there, and they went to Lower Manhattan. And uh, that was really like the nucleus of uh, the mafia between there and the Bronx. It was probably the, the two main hubs in New York, outside of like Louisiana, which was really the first heavy migration to Sicilians and the mafia in the country which a lot of people really don't know unless you're an aficionado of this stuff. A lot of Sicilians went to uh, Louisiana, New Orleans. So uh, my upbringing in, in this life uh, was at the knee. You know, everything I seen and everything I heard, even though my father was not a member or any of his uh, two brothers were a member, my grandfather kept them out, outside of the, getting into that life. My father had a very bad temper, and my uncles, they weren't really made for that type of life. You know, he, 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 but the, everybody was a cousin, everybody was an uncle that was close to our family. So when my grandfather came here, and uh, it was really almost like sent here with his father to go see these certain people in New York, you know, it, it, it's a culture, it's a way of life. And uh, and this is how these Italians stuck together, they even take advantage of their, of their own at times. Legitimate part of the Italian people that came here. I guess things like uh, Caruso and uh, all these entertainers and shop owners. So they, they fed and prayed on their own kind also at that time. You know, this was established. This isn't some, This isn't like a, a gang that just emanated, just sprung up. They had roots. It's just how they attached those roots in the states with politicians, law enforcement, unions, and et cetera. And they helped how they built this empire, which is still today in the states, not that the magnitude it once was because they don't control the judges and the politicians the way they used to or the unions for that matter. So when my family got here in the uh, you know in the late 1800s, they, they was like almost like welcoming committee. So, and that's how they step into the life. And that's how my grandfather gets started at a very young age and then he gets to be a, a very strong figure, which was before it was called the Gambino family. It was uh, his Kumbada who he uh, baptized uh, his daughter and, uh, and this guy uh, baptized my father was a guy called uh, Salvatore D'Aguila, which was really one of the first boss of bosses of the whole country. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. He put people in just about every family or, you know, uh, in the country at one time. They, they would call them like he put a spy in a family. That's what came to say later on by press or, or, or you know, organized crime law enforcement. But uh, he, uh, you know, he had these general assemblies that were in place before and then after he... he uh, Continue this. You know, this, this it, it, you know, when you hear these stories as a young man, and, you know, I didn't hear from my grandfather, of course, but I hear from my father, my uncles, then later on, I have two older brothers, nine or ten years my senior. You know, you hear these stories. And, and other people in the neighborhood, of course, my neighborhood was like 80% Sicilian and about 95% Italian. Hmm. And we didn't have just like a couple of blocks. We had, you know, 
Brooklyn was one of the biggest cities in the country. You know, this is how you how you you see what's going on around you without saying I'm a product of my environment. Yeah. Because that's a lame excuse. Yeah. That's nobody's a product of the environment. You're born in an environment. You could do as an independent thinker. Uh, yeah. You go in the direction you want to be. You want to be a drug addict. And where, where's drug addict, drug addicts hang out? You'd be a drug addict. If you yeah. want to be a drug addict. You don't hang out with drug addicts. Yeah. If you want to be in the mob and you emulate or, or idolize those figures, and you want to lead that past, then you try to, you know, grow in that life. If you don't want it, you go be a lawyer. Go be a cop. Yeah. You know, so like I said, what I seen, what I, I, you know, my perspective of what I see, and I see a total amount of uh, people respect uh, how they handle themselves, how they handle their families. I, I gravitated to that. Interesting, you know, as a teenager, then a uh, young man, we all kind of want to. Uh, you know, we have these <laughs> expressing ourselves and and starting to move into something. I, I would assume that uh, you probably started getting into some kind of crime as a teenager in, in order to be noticed by somebody or, or they would start noticing that because, you know, you don't into a crime family or any kind of organization like that. They're not just going to take anybody in. You're going to have to uh, all of a sudden rumors will start. Hey, you hear this Mikey kid? Uh, uh, you know, hey, he's pretty tough. You know, he can, he, he can handle himself. Well, you know, you, 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 got a, you got a real valid point. Like, you know, when I was a kid, my grandfather bought two houses when he, when he started making some money when he first got off and got married. He went to Manhattan, then he moved to Brooklyn where he bought these houses. Uh, it was a double yard, and my grandfather was old-school Italian, and he had his grapes, he had his figs, he had his cherry trees, he had his peach trees, he had all his fruits and vegetables. He would tend to his garden every day and then go to the club, you know, or to continue on his business. I would get the, the fig season would come along. Yeah. And they called me Michael Lee. He, that's, he spoke very, very broken English and very mm-hmm. little, limited uh, English. He said, Michael, go bring the fix to Paulie. Go bring the fix to Jerry at the club. These two guys that he was talking about uh, were much older than I. Their fathers were murdered in the mob. Mm-hmm. And they were very close to my grandfather, like I was saying earlier with this one guy, Daguila, uh, was my, go- my, my father's godfather. And he was murdered uh, October 10th, 1928. Uh, and this was this guy was the whole guy the guy who ran the country at one time yeah so that was my father's godfather and my father got to know this guy because he was killed around when my father was 16 years old my father was born 12 1912 so you know these were my cousins even though there was no blood yeah these were my cousins because my grandfather looked after their kids after their fathers were murdered Mm -hmm. and their daughters and the whole family like uh, Doug will is, if my grandfather bought a piano for my father or somebody in the house, their family got a piano if he was dead. You know, so they, they we remained extremely close. Like I said, I grew up calling cousin, not uncle. Right. Cousin. So as a young boy now at eight, nine, ten years old, go up the go up the block and bring the fix. I would go in there and I'd be hanging out with all these older men. Yeah. They give me a quarter, fifty cents. Who gives you a dollar? And as you get older, you get that five dollars. You hang around the club. If you get older, you get twenty dollars. You hang around the club. So everybody knows you. Yeah. You know, in that circle, and it's not just one family. You know, of the five families, a lot of people get to know. You. Hey, that's that's what's Tony's son. That's Mister Jimmy's grandson. Yeah. You know? And uh, oh, that's Paul Paulie's cousin. Yeah. So everybody, you know, that travels around the circle get to know you. Now I had I had really three sets of friends. I had the guys I grew up playing ball with because I was I, I was considered myself an athlete. I like to play baseball, football, football, etc. I had those set, uh, set of friends. Then I had my gang friends. It was in, in itself separate than the the, the the sport guys. And my gang friends is where I put, built my rep up as a street guy, yeah. as a street kid. And then I had the older guys, which I just continued. Like I said, as a little boy, would go to the club and see my cousins, Jerry and Paulie, and all the rest of the people in the neighborhood. It, and I would, you know, it wasn't just that you, you, you walk in, I was this kid. You know, it was like, uh, what do you want to eat, Michael? What do you want? Do you want something? Go in the back, go in the fridge, red. You want to play cards later on? You want to play cards? We teach you how to play pinochle. So it's, it's, it's something like a, a huge club yeah. that you understand what they're about. For me to get in, get into that circle was extremely easy, like I said, through lineage. So to emulate guys that you know and you look up, you know, as a little boy, that they're coming to pat you on your head, giving you money and giving. Uh, some nice accolades and stuff and big, it's like you know it's natural it's a natural progression it's hard to explain to somebody that don't understand that that comes in, off the street and says how do you get in the mob yeah, <laughs> yeah like you said, yeah. said earlier it, it, it don't happen that easy <laughs> right you, know? you gotta prove yourself in some manner yeah yeah and, and there's guys like uh, I'll take you a name Sammy Corgano yeah 
his father really had no connections outside of a little connection he had with uh, somebody he knew that protected his uh, dress shop. But yeah. Sammy wasn't growing up at the knee of, of uh, that kind of mobster. Sammy was a street fighter. Sammy grew up in the street fighting. Yeah. And he built his way through the street. He blasted his way. And like John Gotti and a lot of other guys, I say, when a guy comes up on his own without any family history yeah. to push him, yeah. he, you blast your way in, especially if you, you're prone to violence, which these guys were. Interesting. So, yeah, there's different ways to get in. You know, I guess before we, we move away from your uh, earlier years, uh, you got the nickname Mikey Scars. And I've had discussions with other people about nicknames. And sometimes the press give them, sometimes the cops do, and the press picks up on it. And sometimes they've been given a nickname by their, their peers, uh, their yeah. their brothers or their family or, or their pals because of something. Now, how'd you get the nickname Mikey Scars? I come from an Italian neighborhood. There's a lot of Michaels, a lot of Tonys, a lot of Denny's. Yeah. So yeah. You know, there's always a thing distinguishing of, of the person because, again, it was a really big neighborhood. It was, you know, a million people there. So uh, I was bitten by a dog at a young age, 8 or 10 years old, something like that. And uh, I ripped off my cheek, off yeah. my face. And I had, I had a scar. I had yeah. a really bad scar on the the back. You know, you're talking the 60s. And... Um, uh, and I got very lucky. I wasn't really deformed. I thought there was a plastic surgeon there. So anyway, I had this scar on my face, and you know you're embarrassed as a kid. Yeah. So now you know you you got you play ball. Who's that? Who who who, who did what? Mike? Who, who played Michael's team? Who, which Michael? Mike with the scar on his face. Yeah. Uh, who's that guy from Bad Avenue? Oh, that, those, those kids are Mikey Scar's friends. Yeah. The guy with the scars, Mikey's now becomes Mikey Scar's, and yeah. that's how it. I, the name, did I like the name? No. I never referred to myself ever as that. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. If I get uh, Michael, I didn't even know Mike, no Mikey. Yeah. You know, it was Michael. You know, how others refer to you is different, but for myself, yeah. I always said, we're, and if, if I didn't know a person, say, we have Michael from where? No Michael from there. there. Yeah. And okay. then, 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 then they found out, well, you know, if they didn't know. You should have told me. I, I would call. I'd be happy to call you Michael. I just uh... no, 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 listen. Like I said, uh, people just don't know. And, yeah. uh, you know. And, and the message was: every time somebody knew me when I was in the street or something, I see Mike. I know that person that know me. Yeah. You know yeah. I, mean? I see. Yeah. Yeah. The, the people that knew me call me Michael. Interesting. Yeah. I tell you what. That you got that native intelligence, man. <laughs> that <laughs> discerns among people uh, who they are and what they're about. I can see that right now. You were lucky in a way you had a really tough nickname when you were a kid, you know? You, you, you yeah. could have been known Fat Mikey or something, right? you yeah, know? Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> you should be happy for that. I always wanted I always wanted a tough nickname when I was a kid. I never, I didn't have, I just, they called me Gary or Jinx. Well, you, you know what? You know, the government, uh, they always play nicknames up because it sounds uh, yeah, yeah. sinister, black, black, uh, yeah. you know, but Yankee Clipper. Who was the Yankee Clipper? <laughs> yeah. Maggio. He had Maggio. So the Maggio, come on. You know, so uh, the Clipper. What does that mean? Uh, the government plays those names up. Yes, they know, do. <laughs> and the press it loves it. I mean, they love it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I know. An, uh, another kind of interesting parallel, shall we say, I just was talking to an FBI agent who actually was born in Sicily and came over here as a young kid. And he goes, ends up being an FBI agent, and he works in Kansas City. And, and, and he, when he went to law school, he went to law school up in Chicago, and he went to law school with the, the nephew of one of their, uh, well, I think he was a, a crew leader, a capo or something in, in the outfit up there named Jackie Cerrone. And, and Cerrone's, uh, I believe, nephew was going to law school with uh, uh, Lee at the same time, and and they started calling each other cuz. Cuz, I, I mean, you just, you know, I've noticed that. You just call it, and everybody thinks you're a cousin, but you just call each other cuz or cousin. You're my cousin. And, and you, because you're both have these real close Sicilian roots or, or some kind of a roots that are close. And, and so he's down here in Kansas City, and, and the local mob boss tells him one day, Nick Sabella is his name. Nick Sabella tells Lee, he said, uh, his name is uh, Leon Flossie. He tells him, he said, you know, he said, your uncle is not really happy with you and what you're doing here. And he thought, what's he talking about? And he finally figured out that Nick had been checking him out all the way back to law school and to, with the outfit because they knew he came from Chicago and found out he had gone to law school with this Jackie Cerrone's nephew. And wow. they were friends and they called each other cuz. And he thought 
Sarone was really his uncle. <laughs> wow. Imagine that. Well, you know, you're, you're onto something because if he is, because most of Sicilians, you know, there's very few that I ever heard say they were Italian. Yeah. Most of Sicilians, when you ask them, they'll say they're Sicilian. Mm-hmm. You know, what's, what, are you Italian? No, I'm Sicilian. Yeah. There's always been a distinction. This goes back to unification, Italy and all that other stuff, Garibaldi and and uh, Sicily, Sicily was like stepchild and uh, never yeah. part of the mainland until uh, Gar- Garibaldi unified them. Well, going through that history, S- S- Sicily is one of the most conquered place countries ever. i got to call Sicily a country. Yeah. Because at the time, they're unknown. They're one of the most conquered ever. And the influx of food and, and mixture of blood through rapes or marriages or whatever it was at the time, they became so bitter with so many people after a while, you know, the yeah. French, the Spanish, you know, go right down the line, the Moors, yeah. you keep going down the line. So Sicilians have this own independence and, and, and virginity towards uh, being called a, a, an Italian. <laughs> yeah. So um, moving right along, I guess, when you're in your 20s and, and you're going to the, uh, I'm looking here, my research said that you were going to this Veterans and Friends Social Club in Brooklyn, which is part of the Gambino family, which would be where you would go. Uh, it seems like uh, that's kind of where you, you got started, and that's where your your, your cousins were, the ones of your cousins, your mentors. Kind of how did well, you how you progress after that, I guess? Yeah, well, actually, I got started way before that. I got started way before that. Uh, I had my own social clubs. I had my own crew of guys. Uh, you know, I had my own uh, recognition. Ah. When, uh, when Carlo Gambino dies, and uh, I think it was the fall of 75, uh, Paul Castellano was already in, in, involved in opening up that club in, right by my where I, you know where we live in Benson, actually Bed Beach, Brooklyn. That social club, Veterans Friends, was my family's charter to open the social club. Ah, yeah, that was that was my, from my family. You know, when when uh, Paul opened that club, Paul Castellano opened that club. He was there basically every Thursday and every Sunday, occasional Monday nights. About that time, uh, all the captains, all, all the soldiers would migrate to the club to see Paul. Yeah. You know, everybody blames John for ordering everybody to come around, which he did Yeah. Uh, later on in, in, in time, which wasn't too much later on. But Paul just did about the same thing without ordering everybody to come around. And everybody would go around there. So I got to meet more people at that time. Again, I'm 21 years old in 76. Yeah, you know, I would go there with my my baseball uniform on. They, as a matter of fact, the FBI showed me photos, uh, surveillance photos with me and my baseball <laughs> so all the football outfits. I got long hair, but it's the seventies. I got long hair. Yeah, all these guys got fedoras on, cropped hair, straight leg yeah. pants, smoking cigars, and <laughs> yeah. here's this kid standing outside. You know, but again, my my you know my transition to that was. Like anything else, it's like going to the grocery store. Yeah. I just went to the club. Again, it was my my family's charter. Paul asked if we could have the charter, and of course, my father went and got it with my uncle, and they brought it to the club and, and uh, incorporated it again. Uh-huh. And that's how it comes better than a friend. So when I'm there, I get to meet a lot of people that I don't from from out of state, the captains and, and soldiers that would come around and uh, pay homage to Paul. You know, you got to meet everybody. different families, of course. I got to know. So now my exposure being around because I would go dressed you know after the ball after I played ball I would get dressed and go back you know put his college shirt on nice pair of slacks and fancy shoes and all that stuff and go show up and just sit there and listen yeah sit there and listen not talk unless you're spoken to say minimal words that's the way I was taught you know did you get to know everybody yeah so now now I got a different world you know what I mean that's a different segue for me because uh, you know when you run into somebody and you move around the city as you're getting older oh yeah you'll you know, oh, didn't I see you by uh, Paul's club? Oh, yeah, yeah, how you doing? I'm sorry. Yeah, we are friends with Paul Zach and this and that. It's not talking. So you develop these relationships with older people. My thing was I had a, 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 a niche. Till today, I like older people. Yeah. You know, so that was one set of my friends also. Growing up was the older guys, like yeah. I articulated earlier. I had a club around the corner from Paul. Okay. As a matter of fact, one, it's like, a, it's like a little, like a half a city block away. I was allowed to open up a club, my own club with my own friends. On the, uh, right a half a block away huh. from Paul. So, you know, uh, it, 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 like I said, it, everything was easy for me. And who was on the other corner? The Lucchese guys, you know, <laughs> Tony Corallo's guys. It was they had another half a block, and we used to stay in the Chinese restaurant, go to their bar, yeah. with Gas Pipe Castro and Dick Amuso uh, used to hang out. So, you know, you, they, everybody knows you, like I said. So I started Shylock at a young age before uh-huh. that. 
I started bookmaking at a young age, taking sports. Now I give like a uh, hundred dollar loans out. Yeah. Hundred dollars a week, and you pay back one twenty, ten dollars a week. Yeah. You know, they like called the knockdown loans. But I, like I said, I started that when I was a kid. I had a book of every Shylock and as a kid. So and then you take bets with friends, and you go back and forth. Yeah. Uh, you know. So it 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 it, it wasn't even like it was a crime. It it probably wouldn't seem like it's a crime, especially the sports booking and and then that kind of almost closed community that you lived in and the Shylock and a lot of people you know they didn't have payday loan places ever on every corner and people no, they need something to tide them over <laughs> you were you were the payday loan guy yeah exactly and there was plenty of Shylocks available at different levels yeah you know there's people they give and I give out a hundred dollar loan I, my, my biggest loan I remember one time when I started it big it was 500 I said 500 what if this guy runs away <laughs> yeah. I'm lose 500 <laughs> yeah. that's a lot of money then you know? <laughs> yeah the 70s and early, you know, late 70s, uh, early 80s. So, yeah. so now, you know, when uh, Paulie Zach, who wanted to be one of my mentors, Paul Zacharia, you know, he seen my ability to uh, collect money and then use me on uh, some assaults and stuff like that and vandalisms and other things like that. He says, uh, I'll put you in action. I'll get you $10,000. You pay a point a week. And he gave me a guy to give me $10,000 $10, so I could build up my shallot business. Uh-huh. I don't have to give out hundred dollar loans no more. I still give them out, but now I can give out thousand dollar loans. Yeah, you know. Now I'm collecting interest every week. I would give charge like two or three percent a week, more like three percent a week at the time. Not no more knockdown loans. And then uh, you know you build up your business, and if you're fiscally responsible, you're not a degenerate gambler, which I did have a problem gambling later on. You know, you can make a lot of money. Yeah, I and can. You have the rep ready. You don't have to threaten anybody anymore because they know you got to pay because that's the way of the world. There's plenty of shallots. Yeah, it doesn't really pay you to kill somebody. You just got to keep yeah. messing with them. Got to keep messing with them, and, and eventually they'll pay you. Yeah, you know what? The, the, there's different again. The, the Shylock, a, a guy owns a grocery store or a banker. You just shrink at everything you do. Yeah, you know what I mean. You, you, you give out money as uh, groceries uh, and uh, run a tap with somebody. Sooner or later, somebody's not going to pay. You're yeah. not going to have it. It's it's about your personality, also. What kind of guy you want to be as a Shylock? You want to be known as a real creep? Real excuse my language. You want to be a real scumbag? Yeah. You know, you could be, but then there's other guys that you could go on the lamb across the street. We used to say it was one guy, Anthony Spiro, a wow, beautiful guy. He was a concierge of Bayana family later on in life. But, you know, he was such a nice guy, made a lot of money. Yeah, everybody used to goof on him. Yeah. And, and you know, kid around and say, if you, you could borrow money off a of Spiro, go on the lamb across the street, he won't check you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he was a pillar of society. This guy used to build a statue in Benson Ernesto over him. You know, criminal, but uh, nonetheless, he was good for the community. Yeah, the community guy. You know? yeah. So again, that, those are, that 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 was my my, my upbringing. After Paul opened the club, you're right. I springboarded up after that. Yeah. Course, I got to meet different people. I started to become older, more mature. Seventy six, I was twenty one. So uh, now you start moving around. So you know, uh, restaurants. You're making some money. You go to restaurants, and where do you go? You gravitate to the restaurants where all the gangsters hang out. Yeah. <laughs> and now you go into clubs, at discotheques and stuff. Well, you know, all the, all the older guys spending big money going out. They're drinking and having a party. Girls all over, cars all over. You know, and, and you, you want them in that circle. Yeah. It, you know, it, it's a glorified life at the time when you have no issues. Yeah. You, you probably yeah. never you probably yeah. never used that, uh, uh, yeah, I'm a connected guy to, to impress a girl in one of those joints, did no, you? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Look, first of all, that, that, that wasn't me. You, know, you I, didn't I do that. Myself, okay, good. <laughs> no, I, I found myself very talkative. Okay. Today, you know, because my life is an open book and what I did, but you couldn't get nothing out of me. My <laughs> wife, my wife, she comes from a complete mob family. Her yeah. family is, uh, Frankie Chico was a cousin. Yeah. Oh, uh, wow. So, uh, and he got blown up. He was the under Boston family one time. She knew, you know, the street. She knew. She was a street girl. She didn't do no crimes in the street, you know, but she knew but the she way knew. the world yeah. of the street, you know. She, that, I could never, I never told her anything in life. She would ask me something. I never, never, she would never, even if she tried to ask me, it would be none of your business. Yeah. Go ask your father. <laughs> Things like that, you know. But she would never go down the road. Even, uh, Madeline, my now wife, never, never, ever would I subject them or put them in a position to know anything about me. That's interesting. You want to read something in the newspaper? That's on you. Yeah. I never done you anything. Yeah. And where a lot of guys, they did exactly later on what you did. It yeah. was people, I would go to a club and a girl would tell me, yeah, it just got made. I would look at that and say, what, yeah, what the fuck are you talking about? I can imagine what? somebody's yeah, talking. Just got made. Joe, we just got made. <laughs> yeah. I said, ah, what the hell's good? These guys, well, who told you that? He told me. Oh, shit. 
what? Uh, what you got to be kidding? Throw a party for himself in Staten Island. Yeah. What? <laughs> you know? So, you know, it, it, that's part of the demise and the watering down of, of the vacuum effect, effects from different people co- co- cooperating yeah. and murders that happen. You know, the, that old school and that, that grind and the me stage. We yeah. become a me stage. The mob is even become a me stage. Facebook and all this other stuff. Yeah. So, uh, you know, people announcing who they are. Uh, you know who I am. I know, yeah. I know who are. You got a badge? You got something on your chest? What do you got? You got sign? What do you got? Card? What do you got? You know who I am. What are you I, fucking kidding me? You I, I got an FBI agent friend here that worked with on the uh, local family for years, and recently, actually, I was uh, I made I made a, a documentary film about. Uh, us working on the mob here in Kansas City and exposing the skim from Las Vegas, and I was part of that investigation. And and I, I taped Bill telling Bill Owsley was his name or is his name, and I taped him talking about that. And and he had a little aside that I caught on tape that I end up putting under the credits of the mill uh, in the film. And and he says, you know, he says back in the old days, you know, he said they had hundred dollar suits and and uh, manicures and and well cut hair. And, and, and he said, what do you got today? He said, you got ch- gold chains and track suits. He said, it's just gone. <laughs> yeah, that, that, was, uh, that was the 80s. That's what, that was the 80s, exactly. And, and, and it got uh, worse in some circles. Where, uh, just, uh, just an example. Which, which brings me to this question I have of you. When did you cut your hair? You had your hair kind of long at one time. You cut it. And, and I know in Kansas City, our boss, Nick Savelli, he hated a young guy with long hair. It, we we had one, and, and they were talking, and he, this dude ends up getting found in the in the trunk of his car. But they were talking about him, bad mouthing him on a wiretap. Not you know, not like they were going to kill him. They just bad mouthed him, and he said, "What's with what's up with this fucking guy? He looks like a fucking hippie." <laughs> yeah, right. So, <laughs> we had yeah. So you had to cut your hair. Hippie's hair was shoulder length and longer. Yeah. Like the song. But uh, it, it is with shoulder and up. Yeah. Now, you know what? It, it, it's a, a pretty good question. You know, I was never ever asked to cut my hair. Yeah, you know? really. They thought it, I bet. I bet somebody yeah. older guys thought it. Yeah, 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 the old timers did. But you know what? They had kids and they had grandkids too. Yeah, yeah, they that's true. Long hair. You know, it, 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 I, I started to cut my hair as the style changed. Yeah, yeah. You went into the disco era, you know, this disco era bloomed the late seventies just about, and everybody had that short crop haircut. They start getting you know, clean. Yeah, look, look, everybody had the same thing, but New York cut, slick it back, yeah. you know, straight all the way back. So <laughs> that, I went along with the times, but it's interesting. I never thought about that. Nobody's ever told me to cut. <laughs> Okay, like I said, I'm not a facial hair guy, so I never had a problem. I don't believe I've never had a mustache, never had a beard. Yeah, I can never grow one anyway. I don't think. Yeah. Uh, no, I wasn't that interesting. I never ran into that problem. Yeah, this guy, this guy in Kansas City, absolutely refused to allow anybody to come in the social club that had a beard at one point in time. And he finally relaxed when when he got real old, and his brother uh, wanted to grow a beard as a, like an old man. But <laughs> but for a long time, there was no facial hair, none right. at that yeah. social club. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I, I didn't know it was in Kansas City. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. but I guess it was. Uh, interesting. Okay. Now, moving right along here, I guess uh, uh, you fell in with the, uh, you know, John Gotti's, he's, he's, he's the big duck in, in this mob uh, entertainment business, shall we say. You put up something on Facebook or some story about Gotti and, and you get five, ten times as many uh, hits or as atten- much attention as anything else. And, and you were you were right in there from the early days at, uh, as he kind of started his rise. Uh, tell these my fans out well, there I, a little I, bit about that, how you... How you- I, I can tell you a quick story, which is really uh, an inter- interesting uh, thought on the mentality at one point in time. Paul Castellano takes, takes over in 1976, let's say, right? He's the boss. Yeah. Uh, I meet John Gotti... 79 and 78, uh, he was appointed on a committee by the commission from every family to go around pulling all the captains and soldiers and read them the riot act under the pain of death there'll be no drug dealing. Ah, yeah. Complete hypocrisy. Yeah. You know, but because they were all, all the old bosses, they were all in the drug business major. But yeah, what anybody said they were major. In yeah, well, I, I'm doing a I'm doing a, a show over the next month. Uh, I've been researching it for a couple of months now on the Pizza Connection thing, and it that mm. shows how that works. 
that yep. uh, that whole yeah, little right. sub crew of Sicilians that came in for Gambino, the Gambino, his cousins of Gambino, the Cherry Hill mob guys, yeah, and, yep, and yep, then yep. the. Uh, 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 Carmine Galente's uh, little crew that killed him and, and kind of took it over, uh, Salvatore yeah. uh, Catalano. Uh, Catalano, Catalano yeah. yeah, and uh, Cesare yeah, Bonaventre. So uh, I'm doing a whole story on that, but go ahead. I, 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 I okay, interrupted yeah. you. There's this, this uh, committee appointed to go around and pull in the captains of the soldiers, you know, the two or three crews at a time. So uh, Paulie Zach again comes to me and he says, Michael, and I'm not made, I'm just an associate type. He explains this whole thing, that they're going to come in, they're going to bring in Tato Aurelio's crew, Lilo Garofolo's crew, and Jimmy Brown's crew. They're going to pull them in. He says, we need a place. He says, in, in furtherance of promoting you, he says, there's going to be some guys here I want to know. For old times sake, let's use your grandfather's basement. My grandfather had died in 71. My yeah. grandmother was still alive. So he says, for old times sake, it'll look good. It's okay. He says, clear the basement, get in to make a nice and clean, put a whole bunch of chairs around, uh, get some coffee, put some espresso up, regular coffee, get some cookies, this, that, put it on the table, no food. He says, then you and your brother wait outside while everybody comes in, and I'm going to introduce you to everybody on the way in or the way out. So I do that. So curious enough, you know, uh, on the way out, I'm going to say goodbye to everybody, and uh, Paulie says, I want you to meet this guy, John, John Gotti. I've never heard of him, you know? Yeah. He says, uh, John, uh, got a minute before you leave and it comes over with so many words he says John uh, this is the kid I was telling you about Michael Deleonato and Michael I want you to meet uh, John Gotti real good guy this and that so he explains strange hellos and goodbyes and all that he leaves as he's walking away John Paul Isaac which is stunning to me because Paul's a Sicilian a loyalist to Paul and uh, and John's a lovely dad he's a new guy on the block to me you know to me he's a new guy on yeah. the block yeah. and he says see that guy that's going to be our next boss. Wow. In my head, I'm thinking, next boss? Paul's just the boss. <laughs> <laughs> and he's not that old. He's just the boss. Yeah. <laughs> what does that mean? You know what I mean? Really? So they seen the bright star, the shining star in John Gotti yeah. at that time. He was on his way. And he just came out of prison, I believe, a couple of years before huh. around that area. I'm not sure. That that was my first encounter with John. The next one was when he took over. Wow. You know, my friends had some business out in Queens. I went out there with him a couple of times. And there was some John guy, Gotti guys in the gold business and stuff like that. But I never really got involved. I've never seen John. But I knew his presence now and who he was. So when my friends had some business out there. Uh, with the stolen jewelry or whatever the hell they were doing, I went along for a ride just in case. Yeah. Because I, you know, I could always, uh, somebody gave a problem, I could always, uh, you know, invoke where I'm from. Anyway, that was the last of John until he takes over. Huh. So, uh, you become a made guy. Now, can can you can you tell my people out here and tell me uh, how that went down? Uh, you have a kind of interesting story about that, which is... Yeah, I, I was uh, proposed several different times at, at early on, early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. But then in the mid '80s, my brother got killed, and there was something over drugs with another family, so that knocked me off the off the list for a little while. And then later on, you know, things just happened. There's a list that was stopped, and there was all favors done. It came to be that when after John, uh, uh, Sammy, and Frank Chico and Al killed Paul, uh, you have to show up more and show your face. Yeah, John was of the mentality: if I don't see you, I don't know you. Not yet. Mm -hmm. He told me that later on in life. Mm -hmm. right, later on down the road but that was his mentality so you would have to go around more often yeah so in going around more often uh you know these lists are put out uh he, i guess he approved of me the list went out and uh he was gonna put me on a list with his son to get straightened out which is an honor yeah you know because uh he felt like uh their royalty he later on in life again if he's you know the god he's feel like their royalty at one point at all points i should say not at one point so i was honored to be on the list with his son so John, feeling a need for a, a little protocol, does not show up. He don't want to show a little nepotism there. So he has uh, Gravano, Frank Lucasio, and his brother Gene, who was a captain at the time, and a whole bunch of other captains do the ceremony. So John stayed away from it, which would have been nice if he would have been there at that time. I mean, you, want, you want the boss there, but we understood the protocol and what message John wanted to send. I was told to, uh, you're going to get straightened out. When I give you a call and tell you, hey, Michael, come with a suit, that's the night. Yeah. I got that call, you know, a couple of days before, and uh, I was told it's, it's going to be Christmas Eve. So Christmas Eve, John had everybody down at the Ravenite on Mulberry Street. Anyway, so, you know, Christmas Eve party. Yeah. Uh, Christmas party. So we went down to uh, this club uh, uh, on Mulberry Street, and then we walked down to where uh, this apartment was. 
And I, I walk in the apartment, and there's two separate doors. One to the left, one to the right. I go into the one to the left, and Jackie, who was my, Jackie D'Amico, who was my captain, goes into one to the right. Mm-hmm. So when I walk in there, there's uh, a four other gentlemen. And then we're waiting in the room, and, uh, you know, the, the door, one door knocks, and you get out. One guy goes in, which was doing your first, and uh, he goes to the room, and they do the ceremony. Next guy goes in, that was the third knock. So when I walk in, uh, there's a big rectangular table with Gravano, Lucasio, and uh, D'Amico sitting in the front, and all these other captains sitting around the table. So you walk in a room, and you sit down. They sit down, they ask you, you know why you're here? And the obvious answer is uh, yes, right? No. You got to say no. You got to start out this life with a lie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the first thing you do is lie. No. <laughs> well, you know why you're there. Yeah. So he says, uh, we've been watching you for a long time. This is not a club. This is a secret society. Do you like these men in this room? Then you got to answer. He says, uh, would you like to be part of our society? And you answer in the affirmative. He says, uh, hold it. Which finger you shoot with? And you stick out your, my trigger finger. There's a picture of a saint, a, uh, a needle, and uh, matches. So he says, uh, I'm going to prick your finger, put blood on the saint, and light it on fire and put it upon the palm of your hands. And you're going to repeat after me. We go through that. So as the saint's burning in your hand, you, you're rolling it back and forth so you don't get burned. <laughs> yeah, I wondered so, about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got to just roll it around. <laughs> okay. You know, crumple it up and you roll it around. And you say, if I betray the oath of a murder, may my soul burn in hell like the saint. Yeah. So you drop the ashes on the floor, congratulations, and you go around the, you go around, you kiss everybody, everybody gives you congratulations, you come back in, you put uh, everybody, what they call locking in, everybody holds hands around the whole table, hmm. and uh, they say whatever stays in this, or whatever's said in this room stays in this room. Hmm. It's called locking in. And they do it in Sicilian, but that, that's what it's said. So uh, now you sit down at the table uh, with the other two guys that were ahead of me, John and this guy Dom, the other two guys go through the same ceremony. Now they read you uh, the rules, rules and regulations. And everything is what you could get killed for. Yeah. So, you know, you don't deal drugs. One captain takes that. You don't deal in stocks and bonds. Another captain takes that. Now, the guy who says you don't deal drugs is a major, major drug dealer. <laughs> major <laughs> dealer. And there's a Patsy Conti, another international heroin dealer. <laughs> and you're looking around, you know, yeah, I'm an independent thinker. I'm a pragmatic guy, you know. Yeah. You, know I, you don't ask what you would think when they would say that because you're being, you may not leave the room. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and everybody thinks, I'll say, wow, what hypocrisy here, yeah, you know what I mean? Really? You know, the town you can get killed for. <laughs> so everything everybody tells you you can get killed for, you go, you raise your hands to the main you're going to get killed. Yeah. Uh, you go with you, you, uh, another member's wife or daughter and you're married, or, or you go with another member's wife, no matter married or not, you're getting killed. Yeah. You know, if you're married and you go with a uh, made member's relative, daughter, niece, etc., you're going to get killed. Yeah. So at one point, you know, they're finishing up and they said, Any questions? I would have raised my hand and said, Is there anything we could do as criminals that we, that we don't get killed for? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, the stocks, the, the stocks and bonds, you ended up making some money out of stocks and bonds, as I understand. Oh, they, they made money in stocks and bonds. There's <laughs> another hypocrisy. So most of these rules. Uh, hypocrisy and uh, you know they're taking advantage of it and have been before and after taking yeah. advantage of it. so uh, you know that's that's basically uh, what the ceremony was you know it's, it was a very proud moment you know it's a yeah. you, know, you know it's a, a moment that I, I made it an accomplishment it's like going to college and graduate med school yeah, yeah you, see, know, you spent yeah. all this time and effort and energy and and uh, you know practical learning. Yeah, you know, just like you're doing anything else, any profession, you, you, the pinnacle. And here I am. You, you're so, like, you're uh, like me when I found out I passed the bar. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. You want to celebrate? Yes. Right? So, so uh, another question about uh, you mentioned uh, Sammy Gravano was there. Now you had uh, quite a little bit to, to do with Savannah, uh, Sammy. The, the bull and and he's another he's another lightning rod for mob fans out there in, oh, in yeah, a different yeah. way. He's, you know he's going to start his own podcast. He, he's claiming right yes. now. Oh, did you, oh you do you're on touch with him. Interesting. Well, is oh, he yeah. going is he going to get that started? Yeah, yes, he's right. he's almost there. Okay, well uh, tell him tell him uh, give me a little interview and I'll I'll uh, promote him. No, he <laughs> I'll promote interviews. I'll promote. Well, uh, I'm surprised you did that. Uh, that guy who valued that. I'm surprised you did that. Uh, so I'll. Uh, I'm uh, really surprised. He must have did that for promotional purposes because the guy gets a lot of hits. Yeah. So I, mean, that's, I didn't ask him why, but uh, yeah, uh, he was. He wasn't doing anything with anybody until I see that. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, he'll get started one of these days. You know, I'm not going to not ask. I'll yeah. definitely throw it out there. Yeah, that's uh, that's all right, and and I'll promote it anyhow. Uh, I you know I say no, a, a no, rising no, tide no. floats all boats, so uh, we all that's need right. to do this thing. Well, you know, no, 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 that that that's a good point. That uh, you know you just uh, bounce off each other because he won't have your audience unless uh, yeah. your audience knows about it through you. So maybe yeah, you can accommodate me. Can accommodate yeah, I uh, I can tell him where all the mob I'll, I'll fan that. sites are. I can tell him where all the mob uh, Facebook pages are and the people that pay a lot of attention. And and he'll get he'll get a pretty good following. He'll grow pretty quick. You you know I don't make any money yet, but uh, maybe I will one of these days. You have to have a lot of followers to to get ads. Yeah. But he he probably he has a possibility of doing that because he has such a, a well-known name recognition right, right. so anyhow uh, enough discussion of, of uh, podcast business uh, you ended up getting into the